Hi everyone, Kayla here. I want to begin this podcast with a quick warning. Um, horror stories and novels tend to address subjects that are distressing, uncomfortable, and, well, scary, obviously, which is why we always mark our podcast episodes as explicit. Um, we, we hope that our listeners know going into this that we will be discussing subjects that aren't always going to be kid-friendly. However, some works of literature, such as the one we are reading today, or we're discussing today, include subjects that can genuinely be upsetting for those who have had traumatic experience or have mental illness, etc. For the future, we'll make sure that listeners uh, will receive warnings ahead of time if severely sensitive sub... sub <laughs> try saying that three times fast. Severely sensitive subjects are brought up in the novel or whatever story we're listening to by listing them in the podcast episode or writing them in the show notes and uh, as well as posting them on our Twitter at darkly lit pod. The novel we're about to discuss, uh, let the right one in does contain subjects of um, that. These types of sub sensitive subjects, which is pedophilia and extreme violence against children. Um, and, with this book, since it is a long one, we'll be spending the next few months discussing this novel. So if um, any of these subjects that I just mentioned are triggering at all, please feel free to skip them. Um, as always, listener discretion is advised. Uh, thank you for your support and feedback, and I hope uh, you enjoyed the show. Welcome to Darkly Lit, where we swim through the morphine-infused blood and a sick flesh to find the gruesome face of horror. I am your host, Kayla King, and to the right of me is my husband, David King. Chinese food. Makes me sick. Yeah, that makes you sick, but not what I just said. And to the north of us is our third co-host, Sade. Kayla! <laughs> <laughs> that means God, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're my god to thee. Yeah. It's beloved. <laughs> ah. And uh, we are continuing on our mad journey through uh, Let the Right One In by John Vide Lindquist. Nice. Yes. Yeah, well said. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying Got it. To, Damn. Trying to that right. <laughs> well trying, done. Trying to get that right. <laughs> get that name. Say that name. Hells yeah. Say it three times fast. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but before we dive into the second part, uh, we decided to ask some, well, mostly for fun questions, on vampires. Um, saying if anybody had any vampire questions for us, since our novel is vampire-themed, they are more than welcome to ask. Um, as well, one of the questions uh, that was asked was, what are everyone's favorite and least favorite vampire tropes? So that'll get adjusted. Um, our first question comes from Jenny. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Which, uh, which vampire do you find the sexiest or which, or actually what vampire do you all consider the sexiest? I guess. Out of who like, do we? Fiction, I assume. Yeah. yeah Cause vampires all, are I mean, real. Do, do, do you know real? <laughs> all I presume uh, fictional I mean, there are, literary. There are real people who claim to be real vampires. That is, that is true. Yeah. That is true. Fiction. Oh. Oh. Mm. Antonio I... Banderas' character in uh was really hot in um <laughs> in uh the movie version of um my goodness, why am I blanking? Anne Rice's uh interview with the vampire. I I thought he was very attractive when I was in high school mm. and I saw that. Which one? Which one? Uh, Antonio Banderas' character in uh, okay. Interview with a Vampire. Okay. I, I was really attracted to him when I was younger. <laughs> um, my mind, I'm having a hard time because I'm like, I know there has, there has to be a hotter vampire. Like, if I really thought about it, I've consumed so much vampire stuff. <laughs> um, but one that comes to mind, and I'm a huge weeb about this, is Alucard from the uh, Helsing series. 
I was going to (laughs) say. Or um, D from Vampire Hunter D. (laughs) But isn't D technically a dampier? He's half vampire? Uh, I mean, does it count? No part vampire. I feel like there's so many more that I could name. But it's not coming to mind. I'm kind of angry. Yeah, but I guess if I have to pick one, right now I'm going to go with Alucard. Ooh, also, um, oh my goodness. It's a good thing you defined it as the one from Helsing as opposed to the one from uh, Castlevania. Also, in literary, Carmilla is a really hot vampire. I'm... I can roll with that, too, Carmilla. Yeah. You know what's unfortunate is I'm having a hard time thinking of uh, female vampires. Yeah. That are, I, that, that's really, a, that really... What's her name? Vampira. Oh, vampire. Vamp- oh, yes. Is that it? I don't oh, know. Vamp- I've never read those comics, but yeah, but I like her I, design. Does she, does she count? No, she I guess. Count. Maybe. Yeah. Because I thought she was more like a host, but, but she yeah. She's a vampire. Uh, isn't she? That's true. Actually, I don't know. Yeah. I've never read the comic. No, I didn't fine. either. I know she I... originated as like a host, kind of like Elvira, but then she ended up with her own stories and comics. That's but all I find I, know Elvi- I find Elvira hotter than Vampira. But, but she's not. She's not a vampire. Exactly. She's just a mistress of the dark. Yeah. Um. I and like uh, okay. One that just came to mind for me was Olivia Voldaren, who is a vampire from uh, Magic: The Gathering. Okay, that's acceptable. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, but the first vampire that came to mind for me was Strahd von Zarovich. So, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I'm like in the pocket of Wizards of the Coast anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alan, uh, our, our co-host Alan from, who has actually joined us on Darkly Lit. Hi, Alan. Uh, I, I, we, we have to answer this. This is great. Which member of the Sesame Street cast of puppets would you see the count killing and feeding on? Oh, I think Elmo would probably he's, he'd be like, I'm so sick of that puppet getting all the attention. Or is it more that you wish it would be Elmo? No, I mean, I was okay with Elmo, but I've heard people really get annoyed by him. I think they, a lot of people thought they that Elmo made Sesame Street a lot more young. Even though it was already for young kids? Yeah, technically it was for young kids, but uh, Elmo tends to pander towards the younger audience where mm. with the other Sesame Street characters they're all adult like and you can even like adults can relate to them mm-hmm. and Elmo was actually a more recent character where the others came out in like the 70s and were part of the original cast so yeah okay so no one would mourn Elmo's loss apparently <laughs> I think people would mourn Elmo's loss he's still a very popular character oh yeah I never watched Sesame Street as a kid but if I was going to cheer the count on. I'd hope he'd go for Big Bird, and just you know, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna kill someone, I mean, take take the biggest one down and <laughs> begin <gasps> your legion of of undead Muppets. No, it, it, wait, wait, wait. Well, you uh, know what the biggest one I, would be? I, does he does he feed on Big Bird in order to make Big Bird a vampire thrall? Because I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not big on Sesame Street guys. That's, That's fine. Right. That's fine. <laughs> I don't know why Alan would bring this up because he has a fear of puppets. That's so. probably why. Who doesn't love the Count though? The yeah. Count's awesome. Um, I would say Oscar the Grouch because think about it. Oscar pisses everyone off. You mm-hmm. want to get rid of someone that no one will miss and you know get away with that feeding effectively. It's going to be Oscar. Uh, Fishmeck asked um, asked, can a werewolf truly become a vampire or does it cancel it out? It cancels out. Let's be real. No, I think there could be vampire werewolves. I don't think it Ooh. cancels out, but I also think it also depends on like your what lore you're going with. Like, yeah. I don't know. I haven't I mean, heard of many vamp vampire werewolves. I mean, they probably could exist, but I've always I've always thought that they cancel out because they're both supernatural uh, afflictions. Mm-hmm. Vampirism and lycanthropy are both, you know. Yeah, if if your lore is that they are supernatural, or if your lore is like they're actual species, like I have my own vampire and werewolf lore that I use a lot for like role plays that I do with Ravel, and in that mm-hmm. one, werewolves and vampires are like their own species, and they actually trace back to like one person who was supernatural, but like werewolves, they can have children, but the werewolf gene is recessive. Okay. Oh. 
Okay, that's an interesting one. Yeah, so in which case, I'm not going to get into it. But yeah, I think it depends on your <laughs> lore. So if you want it to cancel out, sure. If you don't want it to cancel out and you want a vampire werewolf, go for it. Because that's... And actually- I think we talked about that on The Witching Hour when we did an episode on vampires, that the cool thing about vampire lore, and you can kind of apply this to some, like, werewolves too, is that you kind of just, it gets reinvented depending on who your writer is. Um, Dan Urkel, actually speaking of, like, vampires having children, uh, Dan Urkel actually wanted to know about some cases of vampires impregnating or being impregnated by humans or other vampires and how that might be possible. And then actually one of the, um, uh, aunt, someone actually, Neruli mentioned that their least favorite tr- vampire trope was those that can father babies while being undead. So what are our thoughts on that? Uh, uh, your, your <clears throat> mileage may vary. Yeah. I mean, again, again, it comes down to the lore. I kind of I have to side with Naru that if your your vampire is an undead, like died and then is pretty much a living corpse, then I don't I wouldn't have it be able to have babies because that's I just picture this sour seed that <laughs> shouldn't really go anywhere. I don't know. That's yeah, the only goes. the only. Do you think Do you think vampires need to drink blood so they can get their blood flowing? If you know what I mean. Oh my god. Look, I don't know. Oh, it's it make it whatever lore you want it to be. You decide. What happens next? You decide. Well, then again, <laughs> like I said, without without that lore, we wouldn't get characters like D, who again half vampire. Mm-hmm. The only real the uh, another famous story that uses the vampire impregnating a human thing was Twilight, and that was done. Yeah, you know what? Fuck Twilight. Or uh, that garbage oh out of my face. So. Yeah, so yeah but that, that's not real vampire lore. Let's let's be real. It's just some nonsense Stephanie Meyer came up with. And actually, Fishmack um, mentioned that their least uh, favorite vampire trope was uh, when he, a vampire grants ridiculous human strength. Or being oh, a vampire yeah. Comes with yeah, be, being a vampire grants ridiculous human strength, which I, I don't see anything wrong with. Yeah, I don't have an issue with that. It, Superhuman strength is one thing but i think i think vampires work best when they're still when they have a lot of cool strengths and and abilities you know turning into fog or wolves or bats being Mm -hmm. able to meld into shadows being able to entrance people and you know all that stuff but it's got to come with the goofy weaknesses i feel like the goofy weaknesses are just as much what make a vampire a vampire Mm -hmm. like they have to be invited in or you they can't you don't see their reflections or something they can't go out in the sunlight. They yeah. hate garlic. They hate holy symbols. They hate. They can't cross running water. Yeah, I feel like it would suck if you're a vampire and you have all of these downfalls, but none of the benefits. Yeah. So, again, it's I like kinda... you got to get something out of it. You gotta so. Balance them out, you know. <laughs> so in that case, speaking of uh, uh, vampire benefits and uh, <laughs> weaknesses, Downsides, yeah. Let's get into the summary of uh, part two. Oh, boy. You want to take this, David? I might as well. So we're going over another couple of days here. We're moving from, I think, the 28th of October to uh, Halloween. We get to Halloween by the end of this part. And um, Oscar and Eleg are continuing to form a bond during this time. They are meeting uh, uh, Oscar. Are they meet, meeting at night on the playground? Um um, Oscar's starting to use Ile as sort of a point of confidence in himself. He actually starts to kind of stand up to his uh, his bullies a little bit. Doesn't change much. He still gets a nasty uh, whip wound on his face from his old friend uh, Thomas, but um, former old friend. But um, he's he's more determined than ever to kind of you know sort of change his life to a degree because of uh, his you know friendship with and uh, you know burgeoning you know. So maybe some burgeoning feelings, too, for Ile. Of course, uh, whether or not Ile is actually just using Oscar as a means to an end or if she really genuinely cares about him remains to be seen. Uh, meanwhile, um, our old friend Haw- Hawken? Mm-hmm. Our old friend Hawken fucks up very badly. Oh, yeah, he does. <laughs> oh, boy. He's so turned on by the idea of having a night alone with Ile, which she promises him if he gets her food. Uh, he goes, he goes, he's thinking about it too much and he fucks up 
a a murder and gets his face burned off by a self-inflicted splash of acid uh, that leaves him in the hospital on life support. Um, he hoped to die, and that didn't happen. Uh, meanwhile, a couple more subplots are coming up. We have uh, we find out that Tommy, who is one of the other kids in the one the one who has been stealing electronics in the first part, is his mom is going to marry a police officer who is one of the police officers been overseeing things at the um, with the, these murder cases. Mm-hmm. And you get a, you learn a little bit about Tommy and his relationship with his mother and his relationship with his deceased father, his, uh, deceased. And uh, sort of we, we, we get some insight into that character. And then our our our, our additional uh, plot continues to revolve the around the the Chinese food restaurant gang mm-hmm. who are now looking for their their poor lost friend. Um, Lack in particular has been hit pretty hard by them. And then they're joined by a new character named. And now I got to make sure I get the pronunciation. right. Is it is it uh, Gossa? 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 Gosta? Gosta. 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 So Gosta. they're joined by Gosta, who is apparently a crazy cat man. <laughs> he has 28 cats in his apartment and perpetually smells of cat piss and claims that he saw, um, oh my gosh, I'm already forgetting characters' names. J- Jock? Jock? Jock, yeah. yeah he saw Jock. Jock be murdered. He basically saw the setup well, for Jock's murder. He saw a child throw a rock at a street lamp, hide in an underpass, saw Jock go in the underpass, and never come out of the underpass. That's right. So it's not a lot to work with, but they're all, but they're convinced at this point that something did happen to Jock. They think a uh, kid mugged and murdered him. Yeah, that's what, that's the main thing they suspect so far. Uh, and finally, there's a bunch of talk about a Russian submarine, but that's more just kind of about what's happening in general. Uh, by the end of this pot, part, um, uh, Oscar and Eli's bond is stronger than ever. Um, okay. and Oscar is considering the ways, to, he's considering, you know, getting himself more like in shape. Kind of. He wants to like start. He wants to stop being such a push around, basically. Yes. And m- kind of for Eli's sake. Um, and uh, this is so. And we're at an interesting crossroads here with this mm-hmm. story. So that's my kind of awkward summary of this. That book. Was good. That was good. Uh, the only thing oh, I want to add is that uh, Oscar did ask Eli to go out with him. <gasps> oh. Oh, I mean, I did. I did want to talk about that bit because it's very interesting. That's a very sweet moment. A we- it's str- it's a very bittersweet moment, I would say. Yeah. Oh, we also finally get Elay's perspective while she's high on morphine. Yes, <laughs> yes, we did get a chapter finally with Elay, <coughs> which is interesting because we haven't had anything from Elay's perspective in the first part. Mm-hmm. That was a fascinating scene. To How me. do we want to go about this? I say we talk about Tommy, then okay, then, um, Lock. And them. We yeah, kind of work our way up to the got, important characters. Yeah, yeah we got our way still up to the we have, ones. We have three different kind of... St- uh, I would say four if you count Hawkins. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, right, let's, let's go, go sub- Tommy, Locke and the crew, pull the band-aid off with Hawk- Hawkins, and then we'll end with semi-sweet stuff of the of Eli and... Uh, and, and, and on a high note, because we still don't know how much this is manipulation and how much this is genuine. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay, we'll get to it. We'll get. To it. Okay, <laughs> we'll get yeah. to that. Yeah, no, this is gonna be good. So, um, yeah, let's start with Tommy and his situation with his mom and uh, his soon-to-be stepdad. Soon-to-be mm. stepdad. Is this the is cop that his mom marrying the same cop that was like doing the little drug lesson with the class in the beginning? No, no, that was a different cop. Although different he, cop? No, okay. those two cops know each other. Okay, because they talk about how the other cop is going to schools and doing these things. Yeah, the fir- the first cop is Gunner Holmberg. It's yeah, Gunner Holmberg. Oh, okay. Yes. And Holmberg gets brought up a couple times. Holmberg is on the case for the two. Um, the, the the attempted murder and then the eventual like arson that happened later in this part. Mm-hmm. So okay. So yeah. So Tommy, Tommy though. I, um, I find this it's interesting, but it, they're the least co- interesting chapters for me, which is why I wanted to talk about them first and get them. Yeah. Out of the way. The, here's a, the thing: is they're interest they're interesting to me if I separate it from the rest of the story because on its own, yeah, it it there is an interesting story here. A boy. Dealing with um, his, I mean, his dad's passed away, and now he's dealing with his mom deciding to remarry a cop of all things, and yet he's the type of person that sells stolen stuff. Um, I mean, on its own, it's interesting, but then 
it's part of a bigger story that's I'm still even trying, much more interesting. I'm still trying to figure out how Tommy factors in. Because here's the thing. With this part, you're starting to see the threads that are eventually going to come together later. Mm-hmm. You can see that if you know your, your you know, you know writing. That's where you can I'm see that too. Tommy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, there's, a, there's a tangential connection just because uh, Staffan, his, um, his mother's uh, fiancé, mm-hmm. is directly involved in the case now of trying to figure out yes. who um you know not he was there for the for when Hawken was taken in taken mm-hmm. into custody and he was there for the house fire and saw Elay's tracks in the snow mm-hmm. so there's that connection but we still don't know quite and tommy of course knows oscar he's yeah. in the same complex well, yeah and tommy has uh sold stuff to oscar he re, um because he learned remember he learned oscar has a uh paper route and that's how he makes money and actually in this chapter tommy does pay him back yeah actually also in this part don't we learn that is it lack or virginia that's in the same complex because I think they see virginia. oscar they see because lack sees oscar on his paper route at the end of the part i, I think it's virginia i'm not gonna lie i think um i mean well, I they, think this... they went back to virginia's place yeah i think Honestly, the story with Virginia and Locke is a little more boring to me than Tommy's story. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I have to respectfully disagree. I actually think that that bit is not as intriguing to me as um, as the stuff with Tommy. And I don't know why. I think it's just there's, there's some interesting thing about exploring Tommy as a character. And I wonder where that's going to go. I think for me it's because Tommy was at the beginning, too. Like, he actually, we were introduced to him a little more earlier on. And it, the Chinese restaurant didn't get introduced until... A little more later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did like that we had a moment with uh, Tommy kind of being big brotherly towards Oscar. Mm -hmm. Caught him in this hangout. That was kind of endearing towards Tommy's character. I did like that. And I will Mm -hmm. agree that the the sub story of Locke and his Virginia, is that her name? Yeah, her name's Virginia. That is less boring. That is more boring because I completely forgot about that. And I, when I said Locke, I was only thinking about them trying to find out why their friend was murdered or where his body is. Um, yeah. I don't know. I still, I'm at that point where I'm like, okay, Tommy, are you just giving, like, what, what are you here for? What are you bringing to the table? <laughs> um, so I'm not super invested in what's going on with Tommy yet. Cause I, I feel like I've seen this part of the story many times before. Mm-hmm. The um, whole, like, I'm, but I I'm... am. But I am still in. I still want to see, like, okay, well, what's, wh- how are you, how are you gonna, what are you bringing to the damn table? Well, here's, here, here's a, here's a thought. Because he's now, now we have a very religious character in the story. Mm-hmm. We have, we have Staffan mm-hmm. as a result. Mm-hmm. And Staffan's kind of got a plot in himself now, but it's related to Tommy. So, um, the circle is closing. Um, even as we get more characters, the circle is closing. You don't suppose the fact that he's, and I haven't read ahead or anything at this point, uh, that he's got like crosses and other holy symbols in his place or, and the conviction of that, is that going to come into play against Elay as a proper vampire trope? You know how they are supposed to be repelled by crosses and other symbols of, of, uh, God. It's a possibility for sure. I also have not mm-hmm. read ahead. I've been, I've been good. I've been waiting. Good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's fun, so. It's hard because it's really, it was an, you know, the nice thing about doing Darkly Lit this way, uh, with this particular arc is that the, um, doing them in sections has really allowed, allowed us to, I think, engage in the material more. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it makes each read a lot more sort of quick. So I can kind of focus on the material there. So I got through it, wanted to keep reading, had to stop. And it makes me just feel more compelled to do the, the third, uh, part three when that we get around to that. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to, to what happens next. Mhm. Mhm. It that's the one thing that's really good despite like again bo- when we say boring parts the writing is still really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. We only we only say it's boring because in comparison to like some of the other things it's got a little more like uh tension or like there's there's more stakes. Um uh-huh. th- mm-hmm. that that part obviously is more interesting but I mean overall everything is 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 like oh, okay okay we're still reading like yeah. Can I can I say hot stakes hot vampires? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had to find the pun. That's not bad. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Um, well, I mean, okay, I was about to ask any predictions as to where, where Tommy or Stefan, Staffan, Staffan, right? I think it's Staffan. Staffan, yeah. 
We'll call them stopping. Um, so maybe some of the religious stuff will come in through them. It would be kind of cute if they, like, together, they end up, like, working together to, like, protect themselves from Ile or protect the mom from Ile. That's just me making assumptions. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll, we'll see what happens, I guess. I want mm-hmm. someone to die. Sorry. <laughs> We've already had a couple deaths. But wait until there will be. Cl- I I mean, this is a given. There will be deaths of people that we have come to know. I mean, we've already have had one with Jock. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I feel like Tommy's uh, interest in uh, Staffan's guns. Like, where does he keep them? Has he shown them to you, Mom? And like that kind of like. I feel like his interest is a red a red flag. Like, ooh. Mm-hmm. I'd say so, but it could, I mean, you could read it as him being like, why do you trust this person? This is someone wielding a gun, but also it could be like, hey, if I know where the guns are, I can jack them and sell them. There is, yeah, we, we got to use them. We got to remember there is a, um, a youth culture here that, uh, th- that tends towards criminality naturally. Yeah. I mean, With- Oscar's already been, I mean, even Oscar's a, a serial shoplifter. Oh, yeah. And then you got, um, Tommy, who's selling... Ah, damn it. I thought of a better way I could have opened this. Instead of Chinese food makes me sick. Because that was mostly me thinking about the thing. I could have gone, yes, we have no bananas. (laughs) No bananas today. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Okay, we're... Okay, yes, I want to talk about that. Yeah, we'll get get there. We'll get there. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. But, yeah. Again, it's hard for me to talk about... Well both Tommy's story and the Chinese restaurant story, because it, those were the parts that weren't the most interesting to me. And I don't know how much to delve into those. What do we think of the, this, the addition of the bizarre character of Gosta? Um. <laughs> <laughs> With his 28 cats. Dude, the, just the description of his cats made me really bummed out. And I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> those poor cats. Yeah. How dare you make this poor cat man? Um, I don't. I mean, it, it's still it's still fairly interesting. Like, I'm curious if like are they gonna really rally together and and maybe find uh what was his name Jock's body? Mm-hmm. And or are they just you know again? I'm like, okay, what are you guys gonna bring to the table? How is this all gonna come together? I need to know. I know. Um. Uh, um. So, I mean, we kind of, we kind of gave, gave service to those parts. Do we want to start talking about where things get for us were interesting, which is our remaining two sort of plots, our remaining two character yeah, perspectives? Yeah, Hawken is. Let's get Hawken out of the way because we, we have to address <laughs> him being a pedophile is again. Disturbing. He's disturbing. Uh, his parts were actually the parts where I was like most glued to the page in that mm-hmm. you know when you like drive by a car accident and you want to look and you yes, yes. Like, that kind of feeling um, I, I, I'm not gonna lie I had the same thing especially there's a when there so there is a point where he splashes the acid on his face and then although this is a, this is from Stefan's point of view where he sees the face and the description of Ugh. how it looks Mm. It's so horrifying. It's great. <laughs> it's, so, oh God. it's like one of those things like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. That's amazing. <laughs> so good. Mm, maybe it's, it's just, so uncomfortable. It's uncomfortably Talking good. Talking about a horror story. Yeah. No, that's, it's gr- I love the description. It's a great description. Yeah, it's great. It just makes me sick. Oh, it's wonderful. I want to write horror that good. <laughs> like... <laughs> The build up to it was great too. Well, well, here's the funny part because it's like it is build up and he's about to. This whole thing is caused because he decided to get horny while three young boys. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. This is. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't that, like it was established yeah, before. This is why there's a warning at the beginning of this episode. I mean, they, they, I, I still say that I think, unlike the first part, um, I mean, we already had established that the author takes great pains to make uh, Hawken kind of a complex character mm-hmm. and not just, like, hate this person because they're a pedophile. Mm-hmm. But they're still a pedophile, which is a big, 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 big strike against them. So, like, um, in this case, it's just, like, we just see his his pedophilia, like, on full display. Yeah. He's just, like... This is what 
And like, the, again, what makes him make a stupid decision is how elated he is that he finally gets to have a night alone with Elay. And he even talks about how for him, the, the, the joy of it is that he can be free of guilt because Elay is actually a lot older than him, but she's trapped in the body of a young person. And that's, Ugh. That makes that that shows the complexity of his character that he he knows what he is and he knows that it's wrong, yeah. Mm-hmm. Enough that he is still st- will still feel guilt over his actions, and we did see that when he like went to the library and whatnot, and like yes. couldn't go through with it because the kid had no teeth. Yeah, and, then, and I think again, it's it's for him. It's less he's he's repulsed by himself. He's repulsed by it, but he can't help mm. what he feels, which is. And he's still repulsed by it, but he's like, what he wants is he wants, he wants the, he wants the love. Yes. He wants the love of but, a but child. Even then, and he wants a romantic partner in a child and it's awful. But even then he gets distracted by it. I mean, it distracts him so much that he actually gets off by looking at three <coughs> bo- naked boys just in the, uh, in the changing room, locker room. Yeah. Well, yeah I don't know. What the, the private changing room. Yeah, he has a private. He has his own private changing room at that place, and he's out. And again, the creepy image of him being naked apart from a ski mask. Or yes. A, yeah. 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 That was all just like. Mm hmm. Yeah. The, like the I whole. Need to, I need to go wash myself after reading that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uncomfortable and. I still was like, oh, when he threw the acid in his face, but I was like, you, you deserve this, though. You've murdered people, and you're also a pedophile. So, well, the reason he does it is he knows he's about to be caught, and he yeah, doesn't. He, only, wanna... he, he doesn't throw acid in his face because he thinks he deserves it. He's doing no, it no, no. That's Eli. not what I'm saying. I'm saying I, I think he deserves. I'm just clarifying. It. <laughs> that. He's actually because that's another like, thing. Like he car- does... in terms of karma, he deserves it, and I get why he did it because he's, he's it's twofold. He's gonna he's gonna make sure that he co- he dies. Which backfires on him. Yeah. But he's also going to cover his, I- seal his identity so they can't trace him back to Elay. Yeah. He wants to protect his beloved. He, and he, he keeps calling her that his beloved mm-hmm. over and over, like just the, in general. The part that hits me is when he died, he imagined his beloved descending as an angel. And then he adds a boy angel. So he definitely has his, um, he still has his, uh, oh. preferences. Oh. I won't say anything because I know it's a spoiler. <clears throat> I do too. Yeah, there, well, that's uh, I, won't. I saw the movie and I looked into it. Oh boy, I, I won't say any more either. But yes. anyway, he he want, he still wants to die, but he can't because he's now in a hospital under surveillance mm-hmm. with no mm-hmm. face and no ability to communicate. Just his mouth is gone. Oh my goodness, the the imagery! I almost want to read it out loud. Because the imagery is so good, it's just this is already uh, it, this is already like squicky enough. Just yeah, having to talk about a pedophile, which yeah. is why we have the disclaimer at the beginning of these episodes. Mm-hmm. But if you, if guys, if you want to describe good body horror, like in writing, look that up. Just <laughs> it is mwah, disturbing and beautiful. <laughs> it's chef kiss good. <laughs> it's chef kiss good. It's acid face. Mwah. Mm. That, that's some good body horror. Yeah. <laughs> okay, can can we talk about the, the possibly wholesome bits? I'm not gonna lie. Here's the thing. There's a lot of horrifying parts in this, and then they get like cut with these cute moments between Elay well, and Oscar. Why don't we talk about Oscar and Elay separately for a bit before the moments that they come together? Okay. Well, because Elay has yeah. that bit. Where we finally get her perspective. Mm-hmm. Before think... she's high on morphine, yeah. <laughs> and well, while she's let's maybe Oscar. F- let's talk about Oscar first, because the stuff that happens with him standing up to his bullies happens right before Ely disappears. Okay, for a little bit. Yeah, um, but yeah, that's 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 the biggest development I would say character wise is that Oscar is like, wait, Ely is giving me the confidence to stand up to my bullies and like try harder in gym class and. Mm-hmm. I mean, him standing up to his bullies was what led him to eventually get whipped um, by the. Um, wh- what it's, 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 what uh, are they? They're Thomas. Like... Thomas. Well, but, but what are they? They're like reeds, or what? Are they, what are yeah, they? Yeah, like it looks rocks. like a birch like, rock. Yeah. yeah, they're like wood. Um, they whittled the wood to like a fine these little w- branches down to a super super fine point, so they're just like little whipper. The little whipper snappers, basically. And, uh, but they, I mean, they all try to whip him in places that the, he, he can't be seen, except for uh, Tomas. And they even said, "You idiots." Tomas, in particular, seems to have something particularly vindictive against 
against well, Oscar. Well, it's reference that they used to be friends, but then Tomas changed. But that's, I, I don't know why that would lead him to be so vindictive against him so much. That well, there's, there's even a part later where he seems to single, he in particular seems to single out Oscar in particular. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember what that was, but there's another moment after that happens. Yeah, but he, he hits him across the face and that catches Elay's attention. It? I think, man, I don't know, it's been a little while since I finally read that part, but like, it was, they show up and Oscar was like, no. And for a moment, he thought he was he was eyeing Tomas, and he was gonna throw a rock at him or something. Right? Oh or yeah, oh. I think it was Tomas honed in on that, and like, oh, this this shit was gonna aim for me, and that's why mm-hmm. he was being extra vindictive towards Oscar in that moment. Probably added by the fact that they used to be friends. Yeah, mm-hmm. though it was like I betrayed you, but like you're coming after me. I don't know. It's like children. <laughs> yeah, children <laughs> disputes, and especially among boys. Yeah, yeah. But this actually causes catches the attention. Well, he's more worried about his mom, but this catches the attentions of like Tommy, uh, Johan. I guess that would be his name, Johan. Johan. Oh, the Johan. other friend. The other friend, Johan, as well as Ile, and that's when Ile tells him it's like. Uh, I will, like, basic, something like I'll protect you or I could, I'll get them for you. And is, she, <laughs> she was like, huh. she was like, defend yourself. And he's like, what if I can't? And she's like, you got a knife. And he's like, oh. And then he's like, <laughs> well, and, and, and even then, if you can't, I will. I can do that. Considering, I mean, this is where this, the, the, this is where the, the bad influence creeps in. Although, admittedly, since this is fiction, those these are the kind of bullies I'd like to see get comeuppance in some way. So if Ile killed them, or if Oscar killed them, I wouldn't feel too bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think if we see Oscar kill them, it'll be like a serious loss of innocence. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't actually He's want that to happen necessarily, his... but... Because yeah. I, like, um, I like the more the positive things that are happening to Oscar right now. Yeah. The, the, mo- the moment with like the banana stand, for example. Uh, oh that my was... god. Too cute. That was adorable. <laughs> Down to the kiosk. Oh my god. And it, it, okay, so I I want to address this because that Eli's, yes, we have no bananas. Well, Eli's we played no along with today. this, but um, we d- actually did get a book question um from Beth. Thank you, Beth. Uh, apparently now I've never seen the American adaptation of the movie. The for the just the one that's just I let let me in. Yes, and no one ever should. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. no, and Beth was wondering, apparently in the American version, they tend to be more ambi- ambiguous about whether it's more, if Eli's being more manipulative or actually, or is an actual friendly slash romantic interest and wanted to know if we prefer the, m- this more ambiguous reinterpretation or the more explicit manipulative tactics. And, well, having yeah, seen well, the movie, but, I don't know, but I, I would almost say it's, it's, it does seem manipulative, but I'm, I, there's a part of me that thinks maybe this is. I actually think this is, this does feel more ambiguous as well. Like the, the book doesn't feel just like, oh, she's clearly manipulative. I, I don't think that. Cause like moments like this, it, she is like playing along. Mm-hmm. But I mean, she's been doing this for a long time. It wouldn't surprise me if she's That's just really good because she managed to do the same thing to Hawken. Ha- I think there's a there's a there's a sincere moment that passes between them later. I think it's the moment when uh he they're in they're in bed mm-hmm. and they're just kind of, you know, they're playing the little games. They're playing the little playing games out, and nothing paper, scissors and Eli even and, gets upset that she's losing. And they just talk a lot. And when, when Oscar says, will you go out with me? And he's like, well, does, does it involve, I can kiss you? And he's like, no, that's not what I want. And then it doesn't, things don't have to change. And he goes, yes. And she smiles and she actually seems genuinely happy because for yeah. once someone's not asking anything of her that seems selfish, maybe. Mm. Maybe that's rare. Maybe she hasn't really experienced that before because she's, again, until recently she was doing New Hawk and it was just like, I want your body. That was all he wanted. Yeah. Okay. I so your love. part one. When we finished part one, I was like, she's a manipulative little monster and it's all fake. That was where I was. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm like, oh, no. No, she might actually have some, like, genuine feelings and is experiencing being a child for the first time in, like, who knows how long. Mm-hmm. Um, because with that scene where she is tripping on acid, we, we learned some details. And from that, I, I'm kind of getting the sense now that 
until re until before Hawken, she was somewhere where she didn't get to experience the world since becoming a vampire. That is the impression that I got. So, I, that so, was really weird and cryptic. We yes. should we, we should explain the scene where she trips on Morkby. Yeah, maybe so, you maybe you can help me understand it because I was a little so confused. so. What happened was like Hawken. She's hungry, so and Hawkins Hawken hasn't come back because he poured acid on his face and she so, needs to eat. So she knocks on this poor woman's door and says, uh, "Can I borrow your phone? I my dad hasn't come home." And the woman's like, "Sure." And she's clearly a cat lady, and she's just. She, she does need to be invited woman. in. Yep. She yeah. has to be explicitly invited in. So this is further tying her to some more. We know some more about vampires, the vampires of this universe now. Yeah, you have mm-hmm. to. She does have to be asked to come in. But she is able to lull her, the old woman. Like, I think she does trick her into sleeping on her lap. I'm getting the, I mean, that's another thing. I'm getting well, the, the distinct, like, slowly t- wear away your will kind kinda. of thing. The, the way I felt that scene, because the bo- old woman asked to lay her head on Ely's lap. The impression I got at first was like, okay, this old woman in her old age kind of senses that Ely is here to kind of end her life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and lets herself be lulled uh, by, you know, by Ely and by the story that Ely tells. And then her, when Ely does bite her, uh, her fighting back it was just a, a instinctive, like, primal thing of like, oh no, I'm gonna die, I have to fight mm-hmm. back. But I think as like an old soul, she kind of knew it was time. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get that a sense too because even, e- even when she's saying please, please, because another thing that lear- you, she learns is like there's morphine in her system because she's dying. The old woman okay. is dying of cancer. Mm, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I think, and it, I feel like the please, please is like, she's there suffering on the floor. Let's just end it quickly. Yeah. That's she just, the impression more I was like getting. she wants in it because she knows she's dying of cancer. Mm-hmm. So yeah. But Eli's too is like drugged up to really do anything because <laughs> of the morphine. Yeah. That was actually kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I want to get into what, Eli sees while she's tripping on morphing, but also mm-hmm. into the story that she told the old lady. So the old uh-huh. lady was like, tell me a story, please. And Eli starts telling the story about how, I forget, there was like, a long time ago, there was like a rich noble, or there was a poor family mm-hmm. who had uh, three kids, two that were old enough to work on the farm, and then a youngest son who was the most, everyone said was the most beautiful little boy. And but the, the boy was only 11 and couldn't do much. And then, like, the noble that the family worked with, would, like, said there'd be a contest. But really, he was just demanding all the families that, like, worked beneath him to bring their children, their boys, who were from 8 to 12, to <laughs> his <laughs> palace or whatever little... Uh, and the interesting detail there is that Eli was like, all the families waited until the sun went down, and that's when a man came out to look at them. Mm. So I think what Eli, Eli is telling her story of how she became a vampire. Now, Mike, okay, well, and that with that in mind, do you think Eli was sent as, like, it was like a Mulan situation where she was sent as a boy? And could pass run, or I'm not are we thinking, or are we, or is Ela actually like I think, male? I think I'm not going to say. I, I uh, know the answer. I'm not going to say it. I know the answer too, but if I didn't, I would say, I don't know what I would say. <laughs> you guys, the, no, I, I can't. Too. I can't. Say, the thing is, I know the answer. I know I exactly. I can't say it right now. Okay. But, but that would hint at it. That would that hint does. at Ela being male. But then that we do is- have the conversations later on where she's, like, telling Oscar, what if I wasn't a girl? I'm like, oh, well, is she male? She's like, no, I am a girl. So so that's, we're confused. Not a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll okay, okay, well, I'm but definitely I starting to pick think- up that subtext. I'm saying I'm picking up that subtext. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. she's like, but I'm I- not a girl. I'm not a boy. I'm not anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not old. Yeah. I'm not young. Whatever. Yes. Um, but I do think that's, that's Eli's story of how she became a vampire. And when she was tripping, she saw someone in the TV... Who was telling her to come back? Oh yeah, the, the, with a capital H on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my thought is, before Hawken, she was with whoever this person was, whoever turned her, uh, and somehow she got away. She f- 
was fortunate enough to find Hawken, who <laughs> had an interest in in children and was able, you know, like, oh, okay, she lucked out because she found Hawken, who would take care of her because he's a pedophile. And, but because she was with Hawken this time and Hawken kind of like did not treat her as a child because he didn't want to see her as a child, mm-hmm. even though that's what he's attracted to. Mm-hmm. She hasn't, she hasn't been, she doesn't know like what did children do? Because if she was, say, manipulating person after person after person, wouldn't she then know like okay well what what do, what do kids say how do they say awesome or what is a rubik's cube yeah because yeah, because she does try to say things that are slang and it comes across as awkward yeah it comes across as, like when your dad says it and, and dabs and something <laughs> <Dad. Yeah. laughs> now i just imagine you like trying to dab awkwardly <laughs> <laughs> um, that was also a strangely sweet moment where, like, she crawls into Oscar's bed. She's naked, but, like, it's not sexual or anything. It's no. very innocent and sweet. And they're just interacting like kids. And when he's asking her to go out with him, again, she's like, I don't want to kiss you or anything. I just like you. I just want to be with you. And it's it's sweet. It, there is a sweetness to it, and it, oh man, it, I, I that's why I think I feel because there was that whole question we had before: is who do we feel for more, uh, Hawken or Oscar? And this is why I'm starting to feel more for Oscar than, absolutely than I am for. I Hawken. actually feel for Ely the most now. Now that I've convinced myself she's not manipulative and is actually also a victim. <laughs> I mean, aren't when you think about it, there's a cycle of suffering that kind of goes with the transference of vampirism down the line. Cause mm-hmm, she had to get it from mm-hmm. somewhere. And mm-hmm. she, the way she killed Jock in the first part was, uh, like tearing the head around was to make sure that he couldn't come back as a vampire after she fed on, on him. And then the other weird thing was the, the arson situation. Yes. yes uh, Eli was, yeah. was too high on morphine. Yeah. Eli was too high on morphine to have finished off the woman. So, she probably came back, but then died in the fire she set mm-hmm. that Elay set to cover well, her track. I don't, I don't think Elay started the. F- I, I thought my impression was that the old woman came back and stepped outside when it was daylight and burst into flames. Oh, that's I didn't what I understood. That, that's yeah. I was wondering. I that kind of confused me too. Even reading it a second time, I was like, why is they, it on fire? Yeah, they said that the, they were speculating that the woman, uh, she died before she was on fire, before, or before the fire. Yeah, there was no smoke uh, in her lungs. Yeah, but they saw her walk step out. outside and then was on fire. Okay, I think you're right. That <laughs> but like, I've had the impression the fire kind of erupted behind her, like from the house. So it could be the light even hit her through the window or something, if that's what we think is happening. Because I didn't even make that yeah. connection, but now, hmm. That, that makes that's, sense. That's what I understood, that she burst into flames. <laughs> that actually kind of makes the image a little funnier. I, I know that sounds gruesome, but it's like, oh, God, <laughs> this grandma's on fire. <laughs> Burning granny. <laughs> Which yeah. is terrible for the grandma because she just wanted to die peacefully. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why she was on morphine. Hopefully <laughs> hopefully the morphine was still in I there. the cat's okay. Grandma had a cat. Yeah. That poor cat got locked in the kitchen. Don't, No. We don't know what no, happened to that cat. It got cat. out the window. Yes. The cat ran away. The cat ran away. Cat came back the very next Can't, day. Hey, that cat knew it didn't like Elay. It sensed Elay was a vampire. Yeah. That's so true. Cats, was, cats know when things are wrong. So I'm assuming that cat's like, I'm booking it. Nope. Mm-hmm. That girl's no good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? Does that cover most of our bases, our, our talking points? Yes. Uh, there was a moment where Tommy and his mom were visiting his father's grave. Uh, that was on Halloween, too. Yeah. Yeah. And then what else? Oscar is going to take, what was it, weight training or some kind of class at the swimming he, pool? or Yeah, because uh, it, they actually show him going through PE and then realizing he wants to do better. So he actually speaks to uh, the the teacher, uh, uh, Avila? Avia? Uh, Mr. Avia, I think. Yeah, Mr. Avia. Um, 
and that's when he asked about joining the um the swimming classes and he's like yeah just come by whenever and um, on Tuesdays Thursdays yeah. something like that um but he says uh, Thursday. Pero... I think it's gonna be on Thursday and that's when he kept hearing Pelo and that's Pero. why yeah. Which, which that was kind of cute. I like that. I, the... yeah, that was a kind of a cute little detail. The the gym teacher is also a curious character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like he got a lot of a lot of detail for possibly a character. Well, well, maybe we'll see him again if he's going to go to those classes. He probably is. So we're going to see a lot more. I think we're going to see a lot more Mister Avia. Yeah, if they're if this, I hope. I mean, the, so far the writing's been good. So the, and usually the characters that do get a lot of detail do tend to have reason to have detail from what I've gathered. Mm. But um, then again, from what I remember, the the author was known for, I remember the author giving all, almost all the characters a lot of detail. So yeah, I even like uh, Tommy's mother, I feel has a, a good amount of character to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, even I agree. though I don't think she's the, she's the most important character. She still has I... some, a bit of depth to her. I guess. Yeah. And that you can tell that she she's in love and she wants her son to be like okay. Yeah, I feel like hardly any characters here get like glossed over, you no. know, because they're all kind of made to at least feel a little bit not, not like they're too bad, you know? Like they're there. They're people. Blackbird is full of them. The tough part though, I is how much detail is worth giving to characters if they're not going to be as important later on. So, but th- then again, we're g- going by chunks. So, yeah, we don't yes. know. We technically don't we, know. We are theorizing and speculating, and we could be horribly wrong by the end of the next part. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. <clears throat> um, I think that's it. Yeah. If there's anything else we're missing? Um, I'm looking forward to the third part. Yes, I am. Too. Uh, it, 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 again, it's paced very well for the most part. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I think the parts with the Chinese restaurant and Tommy are slightly more boring than the parts with Ile, Hawken, and Oscar. But like I like I said before, that's not to say the whole story the book is boring. It's just they're all worth all part. All the parts are worth reading. I just know where my interests are. Yeah, right there's yeah, still that point yeah. where it's like, okay, I, I'm kind of done with this. I want to get back to. Eli, Oscar, and Hawking, come on. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, again, I can't think of much else to say here. Um, yeah, if, do, do we have any plugs or, uh, final thoughts or? Um, I want to know, David. Yes. If, if, if Kayla suddenly was now a vampire and she was, t- one, either could not bring herself to kill, to feed or she resisted it to the point that she could not feed anymore like she was too weak would you kill for her yeah cool i do the same I for david that. <laughs> i would do the same for david too i apologize for hesitating but it yeah. would be hard to do but i mean kayla kayla Aww. is worth it Aww. Kayla is worth it. I'd turn you into a vampire before you'd have to do that, so we'd have to kill together. So. <laughs> <laughs> I want we, we, we talked, we've had this, we never had that conversation, but we did have the conversation about if one of us became a vampire, would we, would we do that to the other? Like only with the others express consent. Yes. <laughs> but in all likelihood, yes. Sade, would because... you, would you want us to turn you into a vampire? Fuck yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So that's a, that we got a vampire pact now. <laughs> All right. We've got, we've got a, we've got a something worked out. Now. We'll be vampire that's... kings. Yes. Yes. We are the vampire we will rule. kings. Can we will I, rule. can I now introduce us as that? We are the vampire kings. We are the vampire kings. <laughs> oh my God. The next, <laughs> next episode. <laughs> yes. We I just am... got to watch out for Belmonts and we'll be okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, if, if we ever get attacked by a Belmont, can I be the one who goes, what is a man? Throw a glass on the ground. A miserable little pile of secrets. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yay, cool. I get to be we, Dracula. We got to go find a castle in Europe to go take over. That That is a requirement as a family. It has, we have to get it. You know, I hear Dracula's, uh, Dracula's castle, like the actual Dracula's castle is up for grabs. Sweet. Let's go bite all the. Let's turn into vampires and like bite everybody that's going. To. 
That sounds good. I don't really have anything to plug apart from the usual. If you like what you hear here, you can check out our other podcasts on the Creative Horror Network. Uh, that includes Midnight Marinera, uh, Undercooked Analysis. Uh, you can catch up on archived episodes of The Witching Hour. Uh, there's a few. Uh, there's been some recent changes that are going to lead to a few shows merging with UCA as like segments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can also keep an eye out for future shows. We have a lot of plans in the works for uh, additional podcasts to add to the network and. You know, uh, I think there's some exciting things on the horizon for creative horror. And if you enjoy uh, the chemistry between David and I and Sade, you can hear us more on Animusings uh, upcoming this month uh, as we discuss Pocahontas. So, yes, we're going to be talking about Pocahontas. So Sade will be joining us for that. Yay! I gotta be on Animusings again. Yay! You're on it. You're welcome on Animusings anytime. I know. <laughs> I, I, I have stayed scheduled for many more. This is gonna wonderful. Be- I know. I got Lilo and Stitch. Yes. And you got, I got Princess Princess and the Frog and Meet the Robinsons. Yes. Good. It's good. Gonna, good. It's gonna be a good selection. Yeah. All right. Um. So until then, uh, should uh, let's blow out the candle and um. Don't go into any private changing rooms. <laughs> oh, jeez. Let's, let's, let's not go to the swimming pool this week. No, it's, it's to too the... cold anyway. You know what? I got a better idea. Why don't we all go down to the kiosk and see if they have any bananas? Yes. Go find the monkey man. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinera, and this podcast is part of CreativeHorror.com, a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at CreativeHorror.com. <laughs>